Welcome to another episode of Connecting with the Toms. I'm Julie, your trauma-informed movement coach. I'm Dr. Tom, your biological specialist physician in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we are here to help share some information about how you can take proactive steps to live optimally and live a healthier, better life. And today, our topic is all about autoimmune disease and why does your body turn against itself? So my dad was educating me a little bit as before we hit record on this. And I don't know if you know, but there are about 85 different autoimmune diseases. So we could be talking for hours and hours and hours, but we know your time is precious. So we're just going to focus on we're going to touch a keep some key points like okay why is your body go turning against itself like why do you feel your body is is hurting you and not working the way you want it to so but we want what we what we want for you today is to be able to walk away with some key actionable things that you can do to start shifting the tides and shifting ways for you to start healing your body and uh, feeling better in your body. So dad, do you want to get us started as to, well, I, like it's kind of broad, like I just said, like there's a lot of different reasons, but how come people are now in this day and age are struggling? Why are more people struggling with autoimmune disease than ever before? As you said, Julie, this, this topic is, is massive. This topic is multifactorial. This this topic has uh, many different avenues that you could pursue. So I think before we go there, we let's just look at how the the present uh, community, the medical community, thinks about an autoimmune problem. <clears throat> so, and what most people, you know, if you tell somebody that they have an autoimmune disease, the the immediate knee jerk feeling is to think that somehow your immune system has gone awry your immune system is in a hyper response so another and instead of being balanced in homeostasis you basically are attacking yourself so that is that's these 85 plus conditions that we have been identified no matter almost there's no tissue in your body that is immune to being attacked and so if we go back to the most basic aspect of what it is that we need to do, we need to look at why does the body do that? But before I say that, the conventional community looks at uh, any autoimmune disease with one lens. And that lens is we have to stop the reaction, which means you use some form of a suppressive medication that tries to change the reaction so you don't get the symptom, but they will admit that it's not curable. The only thing we can do is try and slow it down. So whether you're talking about lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or Hashimoto's, which is a thyroid autoimmunity or Graves disease, which is a hyper thyroid type problem, they there's a medication that is specific. Now the era of biologics, we see them advertised on television routinely now. If you have Crohn's disease, if you have ulcerative colitis, uh, if you have multiple sclerosis, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, it doesn't sort of matter what the disease is. Here, ask your doctor about this. They're not telling you that they're going to cure it. They're telling you we're going to manage your symptoms so you can have some quality of life. And that's obviously an important aspect. So that is not what we're going to talk about today because that's only one piece of a very, very big puzzle. So I'm going to go back to the very basics and I think those of you who have been regular listeners all along, and I don't remember, what are we at number 35 or 36, whatever we're at somewhere of doing these podcasts, there you're going to start hearing that these intermingle because that's how the body works. The body isn't a separate entity and you know, you don't suddenly start to say, oh, well, you have this autoimmune problem now because something else doesn't work. We have to go back to our very basics, going back to literally the point again of preconception before you were even conceived and look at how does the body decide self versus non-self. And in the case of autoimmunity, the self is being turned upon itself and this be can being treated as non-self. So the first organ we have to look at is or what is our liver? What the heck happened to our liver? to say that suddenly this normal tissue, whether it's your joint or your kidney or your thyroid gland is not is not part of you. 
it's abnormal. And so we are going to create antibodies against that particular organ, whichever it is, or tissue, and we're going to try and eliminate it. We're going to create inflammation in that particular tissue. And that inflammation, unfortunately, is what causes the symptom. And we all know that our symptoms are never our problem. They're just a sign that the body, meaning the brain, giving feedback to the different organs, is saying that something is out of balance. So it's not a hyper response of the immune system. It's an imbalanced response of the immune system. So, you know, we could have a whole webinar talking about the liver specifically because it is well acknowledged that the liver has over 500 different functions by itself, which is why, among other things, it's a, it's an absolutely critical organ and we can't live. It's incompatible to live uh, without a healthy liver. So we look at when we look at brain protocol, when we look at organ development, we look at, well, when when does the liver reach some form of energetic maturation? Typically, we're saying, oh, three, four years of age. It seems that probably energetically, that's... So now if we bring in the whole concepts of trauma, we bring in the whole concepts of preconception, childhood, you know, and we start looking at, you know, before in phase two of the brain protocol, before age seven and say, so what was going on in those years? Was there something specifically that an individual may have been exposed to, be it a physical trauma or mental, emotional, spiritual, energetic trauma of some point that may have misaligned the normal maturation energetically of the liver so that as we aged, specifically these antibodies because of this misalignment now start attacking a specific tissue. Of course, people always say it's genetic. There's a genetic piece of this. And yes, you may indeed. We go back to our terrain the whole idea of constitution, miasm, and temperament. So what did you inherit from your parents? And so did you inherit a weakened link per se? So we look at some types of conditions. We look at Down's syndrome, for example, and say, oh, that's a genetic problem. Uh, we look at sickle cell disease. We say that's a genetic problem. So the genetics does play a role, but just because your mother or grandmother or your father had rheumatoid arthritis isn't doesn't mean you're ultimately destined to have the same illness because we know with epigenetics and of course all this we've talked about in previous podcasts but that'll have to come up again with epigenetics by doing the, our basic treatment guidelines we know it we have the ability to to alter we can't change the gene but we can change the gene expression and the gene expression is ultimately responsible for how our proteins are being made uh, in our body. One of the answers, one of the many answers is, what are you doing for your liver? We know that the liver has all these functions. The liver is deciding self, non-self. So are you treating your liver nicely? Do you talk to your liver? Do you feed it nicely? Do you not add more toxicity to it? The only thing that people generally know about your liver is if you drink too much alcohol, you may develop cirrhosis. And we know that the liver can be functioning for 50 years, even in somebody who is an alcoholic before it breaks down, which tells you the importance of this particular organ and how hard it works to help you decide the self, non-self. So I'll stop there for a sec and let you say something truly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the liver, so basically the, we need to take care of the liver, but still the question remains like, why, why today, why in 2023 are people getting sicker and sicker compared to before the pandemic, let's say versus, you know, like 20 years ago versus 50 years ago. Like why are, why do we see autoimmune so much on the rise? Like what is the main factor? Why are people's livers like failing more now than ever? Would you say? I think it's a, I think it's a combination of the lifestyle in which we live. I think it's fair to say that there's no such thing as a simple lifestyle anymore. Simple lifestyle, meaning, you know, it was family orientated. Even if we go back into the 1950s, if you look at what you, when you grew up, you know, did you, you know, before, even before, uh, and I don't want to make this sound, you know, not the way I'm intending it to, but I would suspect many moms did not, were not in the, in the workforce back in the 1950s and the 1960s. In other words, most people ate, 
their meals as a family, certainly their evening meal. Many of the meals, we didn't have fast food restaurants where people would, you know, go out six of seven days a week and you open the fridge and there's nothing in there. Now, you know, so the reality is, is that in the way life has changed with working moms, with single moms having to take care of their family as opposed to a family unit. And I'm not saying that didn't exist, but the then the fact that mom carries this extra stress on her system and women typically have a higher incidence of autoimmunity. And we do associate that with a number of factors, one of them being hormones. We do know that hormones, which we have had done a previous podcast on, do indeed play a role. So obviously one of the components of supporting autoimmunity is how do you balance your hormones? Well, we've talked about that from seed cycling, either on your own menses or seed cycling according to the moon cycle, depending where you're at in your age and your your menstrual life. The more your hormones are balanced, but not only those hormones, what about your thyroid gland? What about your parathyroid gland? What about your adrenal gland, which of course comes into the whole idea of how we manage stress? And what about your heart or your heart rate variability? How does your brain playing into this? And how does your heart responding to the fact that we have these so-called extra stressors in life? So the knee-jerk reaction is to know that autoimmunity has been around since time began. It's not just a 21st century illness. You know, when they look at mummies uh, back 5,000 years ago in, you know, in the Egyptian tombs, They found incidences that there was cancer. They found incidences that there was indeed autoimmunity, meaning the body was breaking itself down. So it's not it's not a new illness just because of everything that I've just said. Your question was, why is it increased? It's increased because we have literally speeded up, I'll say, evolution in one way. If we go back, you know, two centuries, if you go back to the Romans and say, well, did they have autoimmunity? Yeah, they definitely had autoimmune uh, autoimmunity. And did they live as long? Supposedly they didn't, but it's not because, you know, we now have this great medical system. It's simply because they didn't have enough food, they had famine, they didn't have, you know, the the, the tools necessary to deal with. We look at Pompeii in 39 BC or whatever, you know, which basically stopped time and we saw what was going on in, in that era in the Roman in Roman lifestyle, it was 39, 50, whatever it was in back in those days per se. So lifestyle has accelerated it. It's made it more prevalent. We have more doctors who are diagnosing this. In the past, you know, we'll say uh, somebody said, oh, you have a joint problem. Oh, you have either uh, degenerative arthritis, which is osteo, or you have inflammatory arthritis, which is rheumatoid. And it's like, oh, well, people just went to live with it. They didn't have doctors to go to, whatever. So it is not new. It is more prevalent. We have more more pieces. That we have a larger jigsaw puzzle, number of, number of pieces in the jigsaw puzzle ultimately to deal with. And I would say, unfortunately, we are not taking care of ourselves as well as an efficiently as literally in a simple life. When it was a simple life, it didn't mean that they didn't have stress because I may have said this in a previous podcast, but I always remember saying many, many years ago to an elderly gentleman about, you know, try to give a knee jerk reaction saying, oh, the reason you're having this is because of stress. And he looks at me and he says, Sonny, you don't know what stress is. When I grew up, I grew up in Texas and we're talking, you know, this is probably in the 1900s. He said, I used to ride on a stagecoach and it was not uncommon that somebody would try and shoot at me every single day. So how would you like to go to work knowing that you're going to get shot at? He says, that's stress. I never knew if I was coming home or not. We have, of course, we have mass shootings now the most ever in the United States that have been recorded was just reported. Uh, We have now surpassed and we're talking I don't know, five, six, seven hundred mass shootings in the United States in this year alone, which is just atrocious uh, in general. So we live in a very different lifestyle. And, and unfortunately, even at this time, we have two major wars going on, one in Ukraine, which has been gone two years now, and the the, the unfortunate one in Israel and Palestine that's uh, just, I mean, the horrific things that have been happening in, in that part of the world is beyond beyond exception and then in the united states 
We have, of course, the border crossings uh, issues with with immigrants and immigration policy. There's so many negative things that people are looking at. If you're looking at the, the news, you should turn it off because it's not worth listening to because all it does is add to your own personal stress. So we need to go back to how do we simplify our life? How do you deal with autoimmunity? Simplify your life is the easiest thing. Eat your meals at home. Do your basic treatment guidelines. Do your grounding. Do your box breathing. You know, uh, do your castor oil pack. Uh, do your dry skin brushing. Do your nebulizer, et cetera, et cetera. Go back to self care. We'll call it. And you know, don't spend as much time with social media. Don't spend as much time uh, with the idea of listening to doom and gloom no news, thinking, "Oh my God, what's the world going to be like uh, in fifty years from now?" All these things coming out now, you know, we're going to have, you know, we have one politician in this country saying we're going to get rid of fossil fuel and another politician in this country saying that we're going to get more fossil fuel. So it's like we have totally ends of the extreme. If we're truly worrying about the future, I would think that we should be looking at less fossil fuel. But now the OPEC nations, of course, yesterday objected to the world making this stand that uh, fossil fuels are contributing to climate change, et cetera. So we, you know, you have to do your own part in individual. Simplify your life will be one of the things we'll talk about more in a minute. Okay, so let me backtrack on on the solo parenting experience because a couple weeks ago, again, my husband had to go away for the week for, out, of, out of town for uh, the week for work, and I had to solo parent. And can I just tell you the amount of stress? So I went from a low, nice and calm, relaxing vacation. I was like my stress bucket was empty. Came right back, hit it hard, and I had to be a mom of three kids, running a business, taking care of all the animals in my house, and it was like the stress level went pew. And so when you say, I hear what you're saying, dad, like do the breathing, do the castor oil packs, do the nebulize. Can I just tell you when you're solo parenting, you can't even, you can't even go there. You can't think because you're so busy taking care of all these other people. The re I understand if you're listening to this and your reality is, is that I don't have time. I don't have the capacity, the energy, the the uh, the wherewithal to be able to do this because I have all these things that I have to do to make sure that I'm just living and keeping other people alive, even myself. And so I understand this so wholeheartedly, but the reality is you not taking the time to do some deep breathing at the end of the day before you get into bed and crash into bed or you know put some essential oils behind your ears or listen to some music this is what's creating the autoimmune conditions like most people are i understand like we just have too much going on in our lives so I, like it would be a really interesting study if you know the the academics actually put together a study of noticing what people's stress levels were before the internet age and after the internet age, because I really feel that for me personally, we have the world at our fingertips in our phone, like literally in the palm of your hand, you have access to everything. You have access to answers. You have Dr. Google available to you. You don't even like now, you don't even have to go in to see a doctor. You have telehealth, you have access to all these things. And it's just, it's overwhelming and that overwhelm is what to me in my opinion is creating more chaos and more stress in your body and so the idea is yes there are simple things that you can do to slow down and i mean i've made my entire business now is all about movement snacks and it's all about finding simple ways to help people shift because I understand that it can get, it can be so easy to get so overwhelmed so quickly. Like I literally went from zero to a hundred in less than 24 hours. Like it was like, wow, I felt it in my body. And I was like, okay, when am I gonna take a minute? And I had to like, I had to con consciously, like when you're in overwhelm, the other thing too, is when you understand what happens like polyvagal theory or what happens in your brain, your front brain isn't really functioning because you're in survival mode. Like you're just in go, go, go. So 
I get like the hormones going crazy. I get the stress bucket being full. So what I want to offer you, so like I said at the beginning of the podcast, is that I want to offer you a tool that can help you, you know, like from today forward, what can I do to help get me back in balance? Because like my dad was saying, is that autoimmune is, is really all about imbalance, right? So you're like, yeah, I can do the breathing and I can do all the basic gym guidelines. I get that, but let's take a step back. First thing I want you to do is you're going to get a pen and paper and you're going to rate. We're going to, I'm going to give you 10 things. You're going to rate your own. You're going to fill your, you're going to figure out what your stress bucket, how full is your stress bucket right now? Okay. So I've, I've talked on dad. Have I talked about this before? Does this sound familiar? I can't remember if I talked about it. I'm like, I talk about it a lot, but I don't know if I've talked about it on the podcast. No, not yet. Okay. So what I do is I have 10 categories and what you're going to do is you're going to rate each category on a scale of one to 10, 10 being it's totally stressful in my life. It's consuming my thoughts. It's consuming my life. It is very stressful for me. Okay. And then one is it doesn't really, this isn't something I really think about. It's not really affecting my stress bucket in my perception. Okay. Cause my dad talks about this all the time. Perception, perception, perception is your reality. And that in, will in fact impact your health and your, you know, it'll impact you energetically, biologically, physiologically, psychologically, it's going to impact you. Okay. So perception. So what is your perception of your stress? So grab a pen and paper, pause this and come back to it. But what I want you to do in the, the, I'll list off 10 categories. So dad, if you want to do this and go along, you can. Number one is uh, the first category is your movement. On a scale of one to 10, rate how stressful is your movement. Okay. So 10, I'm super, I can't move my body. I'm in pain every time I move, blah, blah, blah. Or one, I don't even think about it. I go for a walk every day and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So one to 10, rate movement. Number two, diet. How would you rate your diet? How stressful is your diet on a scale of one to 10? Number three, finances. How, how stressful are your finances right now? 10, I think about all the time. I don't know where my next paycheck's gonna come from. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to, you know, pay my bills, all that stuff. Or I'm like, yeah, I've, I'm fine. I don't, I don't think about it. Number four, work. Rate your stress in, on your scale of one to 10 of how stressful is your work. Number five is sleep. How do you rate your sleep? So I can talk about, we've talked about sleep hygiene. We've talked about, you know, the habits of, you know, how to sleep better. We all know you heal when you sleep, but how stressful is your sleep? Do you wake up in the middle of the night? Do you stay up all night? I don't know. You tell me, Just rate it on a scale of one to 10. Number six is trauma. So my dad and I talk about trauma a lot. I do talk about trauma pretty much every day. A lot of people are like, how do I rate my trauma? Trauma, again, it's your perception. Okay. So if you are someone that has been doing some trauma work healing and you're aware of your trauma, if you're someone that you don't even know you have trauma, that's okay. But you have to, like, I want you to think about how much does your trauma history impact stress out your body? Okay. Number, what are we on? Seven lifestyle. My dad just talked about your lifestyle is a big stressor and that's why people are have more autoimmune. How much is your lifestyle? What are you rating it today as of today? Okay. Number eight, your relationship to your partner, relationships uh, with your partner. And if you don't have a partner, rate your friendships. Okay. So we talk, I talk, something I talk about a lot, a lot, a lot is co-regulation and having somebody like having a support group. My dad's talked about this as well in his podcast with his, uh, especially when he's heading a client into a basic treatment guideline um, or sorry, into the brain protocol having a support system is important. So do you have that support system? Are they stressing you out? Are they toxic? Are they not? Are they supportive? Right on a scale of one to 10. Number nine is your energy on a scale of one to 10. How stressful do you find your energy? Are you, you know, like, are you, you have brain fog? Do you have no energy? Are you exhausted all the time? Or do you like energy? You can bounce off the walls and you're good to go or you're good half through the day and that, I don't know, you rate it. And then the last one is family. (laughs) <laughs> we got Christmas. We just finished with Thanksgiving in the U.S. And you got Christmas and you hear, I hear this all the time. How stressful is your family? So what you're going to do is you're going to add up those numbers. It adds up to a hundred. So what, as of today, your perception of your stress based on these 10 categories, you now have a number. Okay. So the goal moving forward or the intention moving forward is for you to figure out, look at your categories and which of those categories has more stress. And then what you're going to do is you're going to either decide, I want to help manage or empty that specific bucket, or you can go to one that's a little bit lower 
and have a strategy of, okay, how am I going to manage this bucket? Because the more full this bucket is, the lower your HRV score is. Because now what you can do, so if you're that person who has a wearable app or a wearable tool, then you can, I want you to start tracking your HRV. I want to know what it is. Don't, you don't have to track it every day. Okay. But just on a week to week basis. So what I personally ask my clients, we check in on this pers- this uh, stress bucket assessment. We check in once a week for some people, once every two weeks for some people. But what we want to do is just evaluate and you want somebody to hold you accountable to like, what's up, what's going on? How is your bucket? What's, what is it full? Is it not? Is it shifting? And lo and behold, believe it or not, it does shift, but is it emptying or is it filling up? Okay. So in some other you know circles, they call your stress bucket, your threat bucket, depending on how, again, it depends on how you want to look at it, but it's a good place for you to know it's a baseline based on your perception on these 10 uh, different categories. And hopefully this helps you understand where you're going for it. And then if you pair that with your HRV, and if you're somebody that doesn't have a wearable, a really cool app, if you don't know about it, uh, is called Visible. It's a long COVID app, but it, you basically just, everybody has a phone these days. All you have to do is open the app, put your finger on your camera, and it'll give you a HRV score. And you just have to take it for three days to get your baseline. So once we have a baseline, then that's something that we can start tracking. Because I think if you're somebody struggling with autoimmune disease, you may have already been doing all this stuff, but just really honing in on where is your stress coming from is a great place to start. As you were talking, it, it brought up something that's also typical that I said that it's changed in our, our environment per se. The, the So I want you to think about, and this won't, think about your neighbors. Think about the neighborhood in which you live. I think about the neighborhood in which I grew up in. I knew all the neighbors. You know everybody on the left, the right, the, across the road. You know that you knew the neighbor four doors down. And if you needed a problem, because I can remember a time when my mom wasn't a didn't drive her car, and my dad wasn't available to do it. How was she going to get to the grocery store? She would have no trouble to walk across the road and say, well, "I have to go to the grocery store." And they say, "Oh, sure, not a problem," because their life also wasn't so tied up with running here and running there and doing this and doing that. So. It almost felt that there was a family unit within our own neighborhood. And we never had a problem going next door to say, you know, can can I borrow a cup of milk or three eggs? Or And if it wasn't across the road because they weren't home, you went two hours down. You knew everybody. Now you're freaking don't have, people don't even talk to their neighbor, or it seems like, because they, you know, they, we never locked our doors growing up. Uh, you know, you could, I mean, there was no such thing as locking your car. There was no such thing as locking the door of your house. You know, nobody thought about it because that wasn't a big deal. Now, heck, kids come home from school. You know, we never thought about anything about in kindergarten, walking a kindergartner walking to school. Now, oh my God, you couldn't have a kid walk to school on their own because somebody may come and pick them up. So we have a very different mental attitude in the in the exact place where we live and you know just applying to your situation that you just described you went from zero on vacation to a hundred because now you're doing all the all the things and how do i do my self-care in the past of what happened we would have gone next door and said i gotta go over here can can you look after the kids for for the next uh, 30 minutes oh sure i'll do that Uh, because you did it you as reciprocation we, we never thought about, we never, it wasn't about, oh no, I can't do that for you anymore because, oh my God, I got to stay at home and I want them to lock my door. So very different environment. We know in COVID, one of the great problems that happened is people get out of their house. Canada seemed worse than the US from what I hear. You never saw anybody. You saw four walls and you didn't want to go out. You couldn't go out. You had ordered food in. You you couldn't even, they leave it at the door. You couldn't even see the person. It was just like, oh my God, have we changed our society? So part of the challenges of self-care is, you're right, exactly. Single, So many single moms, they don't have time because they're so responsible. And, you know, let's say I have a family member who happens to come to live with them, you know, way at mom or grandma who can sort of help out. It's like, you don't ask your neighbors to do that. But we did in my day growing up because I remember that happening uh, on a routine basis uh, all the time for what's going on. So, you know, in addition to finding that's the support person that you mentioned as part of the your partner or friendships or whatever, who can you call upon when really needed? 
to who will step up. Not that they can drop things at the drop of a hat, but you know, it's reasonable. It's reasonable that uh, you know, in a situation, let's say somebody, you know, you uh, an accident happened and the person had to go to the hospital, and you've got three kids at home. What the hell are you going to do? You can't take the three kids to the hospital. So in the old day, we used to go knock on the door and say, can you come over and babysit? Sure, I'll be there. I, you know, take care of yourself, do your thing. It's almost like that's a thing that's not part of our society anymore uh, that's going on. How does it relate to autoimmunity? It relates to the autoimmunity because it's just, it, it's another stressor, as you said, in your own personal situation that you don't have the opportunity to have a sort of an immediate solution you add stress on on an immune system that's already in balance and of course it's not going to help the get better and so therefore your and you said your sleep how is your sleep as far as your stress is concerned if you don't sleep you don't heal that's the bottom line so you're never going to get your immune system back in balance if your sleep is because you're worrying about your kids or this or that so why is it increased it should be obvious by our conversation to anybody listening that's why in the last 50 <laughs> yeah. years, it's not new. It just dramatically escalated because of so many things that are different in our society. And who knows what it's going to be like for your kids and my grandkids, you know, when they're 50 years old and what it, what it's going to be like for their children. Like, what kind of a world are we going to be living in? You know, in general, it's, it's a little scary to think about uh, at some times, but you know, maybe we need to be hit by an asteroid again to reset, reset, to get yeah. everything into a new reset. Uh, it's just like our computer freezes and we we shut it off and re reboot it uh, with the idea that maybe, you know, it could be helpful, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I was just going to say to like to compliment what you're saying, though, is that there's all this research with the blue zones and all this like in terms of longevity and all these things. And you hit the cord of what's the key you know, thing in all the different blue zones is community and leaning in. And it's about having that support system. It really is. Cause I mean, like I talk about like when a baby comes out of the womb, mm. what's, what does it want? It wants, it wants co-regulation. It wants to know it wants that skin to skin. It, that's what humans need. Right. And I can tell you like you, <laughs> as you've <laughs> elegantly say at the beginning of every podcast, Dr. Tom from Scottsdale zone, like I haven't lived in the same city with my parents since I was 18 years old. I left home at 18 and I haven't lived in the same home since then and I haven't had family and it's something that I've had to adapt. And I have to say, it has created stress. Like it would be so much nicer to be like, mom, dad, or my uncle, hey, can you come watch the kids and can you come babysit the kids? Like last night would have been fantastic. My son had a late soccer game and I didn't want to keep the twins up late and that's it creates more stress because it affects, it's a ripple effect, right? And I don't have the family family around. So it, you're right. It does create a huge stressor. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't have the community and that's why you have to go, you know, that's why people find community else, you know, somewhere. And I talked about this in my mentorship group of, you know, like, do any of us live in a, in an area where you can call your neighbor and, mm -hmm. you know, like you have similar values and you want, you know, like have similar ideals on how to live life. You don't know what happens. We don't live in glass houses. So people don't have no idea what's happening next door. Right. And that's the reality is that we all tend to keep this energy and these, this, these emotion in, because we're all going to deal with it. This is what society expects of us is that, but we have access to these phones that help us connect with the world. And all we want is really, all we want is connection. All we want is to feel that we belong and that we're not alone, right? And so I think autoimmune is probably rooted in that just as much like you're saying. It's like our stress levels are too high. We're not connected in community or family. Like just that's the realities is that some of us may not ever have family. So I had to create my own little family. So I have some friends that I lean on and phone them up. Hey, can you take the kids? Sure enough. And I'm like, I'm grateful now my kids are older or getting older that they can babysit one. The older one can babysit the younger ones, but it's, it's hard. It, the reality is it's hard. And so it goes to the, the, you know, it just lends to the, the fact that autoimmune is on the rise because we are getting away from connection and we have more stress. And like you said too, just to, I want to add on to just my last piece is the detection tools. It reminded me when you're talking about like, yeah, there's probably more doctors just, you know, prescribe, uh, not prescribing, but um, diagnosing. Diagnosing. Doctor, 
yeah, more doctors are diagnosing it because we have more tools available, right? At the end of the day, it's just like cancer. It's like you said in our cancer podcast, cancer, we haven't really cured cancer. We just, you know, we're detecting it sooner. And so at the end of the day, it's really about taking ownership of your own body. And it's about taking ownership of what can you do to create the community and create the opportunity for you to empty your stress bucket at the end of the day. That's, that's the way I look at it. So for me, you know, like nebulizing and castor oil, like, so actually, can I just add on the castor oil? So something that I've been practicing, I don't know if you've told this, but I just want to tell my, I don't think I've told this to my dad yet, but I've been hearing like more, we I've been talking about castor oil for, we've been talking about for a long time. I've been talking about a lot, a lot with my clients and I still get the feedback. It's messy. I won't do it. Blah, 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 blah. So I'm like, you know what? Here's a simple, t- take one drop and put it inside your belly button and just start there. One drop, put it inside your belly button. And so I've been doing that. And I have to say, it's been amazing. It's been helpful. And so, you know, like with the whole, you know, umbilical cord, when we talk about trauma with the mother and all that stuff, like uh, putting some oil in your belly button, some castor oil, it can be just not necessarily as effective as a full castor oil pack. Don't get me wrong, but it's a step in the right direction. It's not going to be messy, but you're still going to put castor oil on your body. So I just want to... <laughs> If you want to start there, start there with your autoimmune. Put a drop of get castor oil. Try it and then come back and write in the show notes and whatever. Uh, let us know <laughs> how it feels for you. I just want to throw that in there. I don't know. Did I tell you about this? No, I don't think so. Did I? I, no, I but like I've it. done that for I have done that for other patients. The you know, they and it you are gonna get a physiologic effect. You know, one of the things you're not getting as much of theoretically is you're not getting I'll call it self-care time because if we're doing nebulizing on a casserole pack at the same time we're we're accomplishing two birds you know with what two birds in the bush or whatever it is what better than one that whatever that saying is you know uh, in general but no I would agree just the aspect of doing it is creating a mental space and anything that that you can utilize to to achieve a mental space does have a positive impact on the brain will have a positive impact on your heart rate variability you know that little tool that you just mentioned is is another valuable thing that somebody can do it fairly often you can do it several times a day say uh, do it in the morning do it at noon do it at night uh, you know you have a phone and you're right virtually everybody now has a, a cell phone with apps on it that you can start doing that that kind even of even kids <clears throat> that's even the problem kids. yes even yeah. kids have my kids my not my twins are nine and they're asking for phones i said no <laughs> that's just a hard no but anyway yeah and europe it's 18 before cell it, phones i don't know if it still is in every country but it certainly has been for a while yes kids can not have a cell phone until they're 18. that's good that's great but if you can start measuring just start bringing more awareness to where you're at and it's like okay so i have a client today that we've been um, texting back and forth her hrv is a little bit lower she's sick she has a cold and so i'm like okay let's start let's start with one modality and one tool to help you see how it, it, it impacts your hrv so she did music so we did 174 hertz she played that for 10 minutes and then we retested her hrv and went up um six points and so I'm like, okay, this is working. So what we want to do is just take a look at HRV is a great way to measure, you know, what modality is helpful for you. So just something to, I just want to throw that out there too. <laughs> HRV is a great measure. And I think, I don't think enough people it understand great. it or talk about it or, you know, like when we talk about basic treatment guidelines for me, I'm, I'm going to use HRV as a measure to help me understand, okay, is this really helping me empty my bucket? Cause at the end of the day, if my bucket is full, <clears throat> I will be sick and I'm not going to be able to be able to fight off infections or whatever, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's not going to be able to help me heal. So the higher HRV is great. So just a couple of, you know, going a little bit, one of the, not a tangent, but one of the other pieces that I think people can be thinking about and looking at that are definitely a component of this is how is your actual metabolic systems working? How is your physiology working? We think of the the microbiome in our gastrointestinal tract, but the microbiome is, of course, in every organ system. It's not just the GI tract. So we know that with autoimmunity, you know, we can start to support our own microbiome with doing supportive foods, both prebiotics and probiotic foods, or an additional uh, probiotic, uh, prebiotic uh, nutritional supplement that 
is taken on a regular basis to try and help keep supporting, you know, a balancing of your immune system itself. It has been shown that people who have lower levels of vitamin D will have more of a tendency from an immune perspective. So, you know, keeping your vitamin D levels in the U.S., it's 55 to 65. In Canada, it's because your units are different. It's probably more in the area of 150 to 175, somewhere in that range would, would be a healthy uh, immune response for people. Doing, you know, those types of belabor, the whole idea of diet, you know, the importance of, once again, minerals, the importance of different colors. Uh, you know, we know that the re the research now six years old is saying that, you know, 10 different colors of fruits and vegetables will significantly reduce risk of heart disease, of cancer, of, uh, of autoimmune illness itself. But if you have one an autoimmune illness, then obviously these things are equally important, not only from a prevention, but also from a treatment perspective for what's going on. So there are the physical aspects that we need to be looking at. And there are obviously nutritional support thing, nutritional remedies that will support the symptom of whichever autoimmune illness that uh, one may be, be dealing with. But the bigger picture is how do we get back to finding the balance with our immune system rebalancing. Once again, we're not trying to downregulate it because it's not an overstimulation of the immune system. It's a dysregulation. However, the approach is medically is to suppress it, stop the reactions from happening. And if you listen to our last 35 podcasts, you'll know that that's not our approach. Biological medicine isn't about stopping reactions. It's about supporting the necessary reaction within the body so that the body has an opportunity to recalibrate and to find the new balance that's necessary for, for what's happening. So from that perspective, I would say that you know that's how we have to be thinking about you need to balance your immune system and you do that by metabolic systems. You do that by basic treatment guidelines. You do it by taking time for yourself somewhere in the day, every day, to spend a few minutes and whether it's, you know, five minutes of meditation or five minutes of box breathing, anything that puts you into a more parasympathetic state, which is ideally when we're eating our meals and when we're sleeping, because that once again, that's the only time we have the ability for the body to heal is during those parasympathetic uh, states and parasympathetic uh, times uh, for what's going on. The individual autoimmunity, you know, there's, you can, Dr. Google will tell you all kinds of things for Crohn's or colitis or Hashimoto's or, or psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, or, you know, on and on and on the number goes. They are very prevalent, as I said, for a woman, but also for a man. Balancing hormones, I think, is an important piece. We know our own natural anti-inflammatory. One of them is, is uh, called cortisol. Cortisol gets released in stress. We can balance imbalance that, which means on our DHEA, which is another hormone. So there's there's many players in this game, and you know what do you take home with this? What do you take home for what it is I need to do? Don't assume that an autoimmune disease there's nothing you can do. There's lots you can do. There's lots to support it. Is it curable? I before the whole advent of my approach to medicine biologically, I was taught, and I taught this myself when I was a professor, that autoimmunity is something you manage uh, and support and to try and enhance quality of life. It's not something that's curable. But I will now tell you that that's not true. Since 2005, when the whole concept of epigenetics became popular, now it's not a word that's totally strange to people. It's almost it's 20 what's that 23 years ago it's sort of new it's the it's it's one of the great things that uh, ultimately has happened in medicine is that we realize that a single gene has the potential of of us you know going down multiple different pathways based on our epigenetics of how we're supporting it and for all intents and purposes epigenetics is doing basic treatment guidelines and eating a good diet and moving your body and allowing your body to uh, detox ap appropriately I think, you know, one of the biggest lifestyle pieces is missing, which you hinted on for your own personal life, is not having the time or not sensing that you have the time 
to do what you need, what we know we need to do. People know, oh yeah, I know I should eat better. I know I should, I should move my body. I, you know, I know I should get to bed by 10 30, 10 o'clock, 10 30 at the latest. I know I should be getting seven and a half to eight and a half hours, but my lifestyle doesn't allow it. My kids wake up, my pet wakes up. I got to go to work. I got to do this. I got to get the kid to soccer or ballet or hockey or, you know, baseball or whatever, you know, we're involved in because we're very involved in, which is another thing I think with my own parents, they didn't take us to baseball practice. They said, here's the bat, here's the glove, go and find five kids in the neighborhood, go to the park and start hitting the ball around. You know, we played hockey. There was a rink on the corner. We didn't have to go to an indoor arena. We went, it was outside in those days in Canada and Ottawa. It's like, it froze. It was frozen for three months, for God's sake. We could skate outside. Now the Rideau Canal doesn't even freeze for that long anymore. So winter lube, which was a big deal. And I, my day growing up was, uh, you know, doesn't happen anymore because of climate change. And so, you know, it's another factor that has resulted in modifications of uh, everyday lifestyle for, for what's for what's going on. So, you know, we were outside, you know, you were outside and they didn't worry about it until uh, dinner time, supper time. You, it's time, come and come home, look at your watch, go home for not, oh my God, they're, they're not coming home. They've been kidnapped, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Very different life, a very different mental attitude uh, and people nowadays. And unfortunately, the children growing up, certainly in the United States anyway, and, you know, instead of doing an earthquake drill or a fire drill, which is what I had when I was in school, now what they have in the United States is they have violence drills. What if you're being attacked by a by a gunman? How do you, what do you do? You hide under the desk, you bar the doors or said, oh my God, not something that would ever have been thought of, you know, years ago, unfortunately. So very different place, very concrete reasons why the number of autoimmunity. So what can you do about it? Do everything you can to simplify your life. Make sure that you spend a little bit of your day doing something that's simple. Part of the BTGs is having fun. Do it, make that, whatever that is to you, where you forget the, the the worries of the world and all your responsibilities, but you're just doing something that you don't have to think about something and it's sort of mindless. And whether that's watching a, a cartoon, whether, you know, watch some of the old cartoons, uh, the Three Stooges, the Marx Brothers, you know, those types of things, which are sort of slapstick, uh, Buster Keaton, you know, which is like they, they, you can't help but smile when you when you watch these things. And that's a good, great parasympathetic, get some release of oxytocin, calm your system down, calm your autoimmunity down, and then do lots of the things that we've talked about previously and today uh, on this particular podcast. Well, I have a couple things to, to add to that. So it's funny because you, you keep bringing up like kids in the neighborhood and it's not funny, but it is kind of funny that you you mentioned it because something that my son does is that he's constantly on the lookout for pedophile vans, essentially. He's, so he's looking for vans without windows. He's like, mommy, there's another one. So it's like, he's always on alert for like vans that could potentially take him. And I'm like, I wasn't like that when I was a kid. Like I grew up <laughs> in outside Ottawa in the country and we would come home when the light, when the outdoor uh, the, the street lights will come on so that's like that's the life that i grew up and my kids are definitely not growing up in that world so that's definitely impacting their stress level so i was like oh yeah i feel i feel that like i feel that big time and that's something that we talk about like my kids want to you know want to walk around the block with the with the dog and i live on a busy street where it's very easy for kids to be taken and you know like i don't live in toronto but you know the violence is up higher in toronto and like you talked about like my kids last week they just did a they did an emergency drill and it was for that if there was some kind of violence that came in so these are the realities that our children are growing up with so we have to do uh, you know we have to do better we have to like that's at the end of the day if we want to feel better if we want to heal if we want to get better we have to do better and take the time to as my dad said putting these paramedic parasympathetic snacks so we're we're recording this beginning of December and something that I want to put out to the world is that I've been actually sharing my 12 days of movement snacks. It's my gift to the world. I do, I've been posting 12 different uh, simple, simple things that you can do to put you in a parasympathetic state. 
there are all the videos are on YouTube. And basically I share something very simple, like today was laughter yoga. So what you did, I talked about last time is you put a pencil in your mouth and we did some ha ha ho 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 he 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 hoo hoo hoo. And we did it together. And so you laugh and it engages that vagus nerve. And then I dance at the end and you can dance with me and it's fun and it's just something that you can do. So, I mean, they're less, they're usually about 10, most of them are 10 minutes long. So if you want to go check those out, they're free, have access, have fun with it. And just, I want to put that out there for you as the listener, uh, as my gift to you, like they're going to constantly be there. So watch them as often as you need for whatever reason, the, the facial one, that one went viral on Instagram. I don't know why, but I was like, everybody wants, it feels really good to um, massage your face. So I show you some quick tips that you can do that. Like if you're in the shower, uh, sitting at a stoplight, super, super simple things that you can do. But um, yeah, so I just want to add that in. Dad, is there anything else that you wanted to add in? I think you summarized that pretty well, I have to say, but. You know, this this is, this is the type of a podcast that we could talk for hours and hours about. And But the goal of what we have talked about is to at least hopefully change people's attitude that there is only one approach that's to calm down or to suppress immune function. And, you know, that may be a part of the treatment, uh, at least, you know, depending on which condition and how long, however, it doesn't mean that you can't uh, interfere with that whole biological process uh, that's going on and, and have a high quality of life, no matter which, what the specific diagnosis is that you're dealing with. So, Hopefully, uh, some of the information that we've shared today will hit home. And I'll keep saying it. How do you, how can you simplify your life? How can you make your life just you know go back to think about your grandparents or your great grandparents, what their life would have been? And you know that you know they didn't have YouTube, they didn't have the internet. You know what did they do in the evening? They played cards or they played a game. What did kids do? The kids didn't have fancy toys. They played tag. They played kick the can. They threw a baseball or a football or a basketball on the corner lot, and they weren't worried about the fact that uh, some male or some somebody may come and you know be snatch them uh, type thing. Very, and as your own son, uh, you know, as Caleb uh, is is reminding you that obviously that is the other one in the genre. Oh, it's the, the other, other one. The other son. Oh, okay, the other son <laughs> is talking about it. <laughs> the imaginative one. The yeah, the imaginative one, indeed. The uh, so the aspect of you know what what's going on for people is it's not inevitable. It's not something that's incurable. It's something that does require day to day management day-to-day support and we can we can indeed rebalance that autoimmune reaction by looking at every organ system that we've already talked about in other podcasts but it is it is a real thing it is increasing and unfortunately it's going to continue to increase we didn't talk about it there has been a lot of discussion about covid the vaccines the, you know is that upsetting things I I don't feel a need to get into it with this particular podcast. There's enough literature out there. You can read it for yourself if, you know, and don't read it with the idea that, oh, this is a blame issue. This is where society is at uh, at the moment. And, you know, this is where society seems to be going. And you don't have to follow along everything that's so-called being told. We know that return to your own look in the mirror. What can I do for myself? How can I support what it is that I do? How can I give myself one minute a day if that's all you got? If all you can do is put a drop of casserole on a belly button, then do it. Or if you can do, if you can just do dry skin brushing for five seconds, do it. If you can walk for five minutes, do it. But don't say you can't do it and then end up sitting on the couch. There are these simple things that you could, if we put them all together, do five deep breaths. You know, you can do them all in one minute. And we have 24 hours times 60 minutes in a day. Surely we can take one minute to at least tell the brain that we have the opportunity to do some of these things for ourselves. That's fantastic. Thank you for for doing that. But you just inspired me. And I'm like, we should almost give people the opportunity. If you're listening to this, let's give people a parasympathetic snack. Go ahead and take a deep breath in through the nose. And out. Good job. One more. If you want to add a hold, go ahead, but otherwise let it out. 
And one more just for you. And out. So there you go. We should just finish all our podcasts this way, Dad. So that way we give people the opportunity. You didn't have it. You, you were go. listening to this. And there you go. You just gave yourself a parasympathetic snack. Well done, my friends. That's how we that's how it's done. Simple, simple. And now go go reach for the castor and put it that belly put it in your belly button. <laughs> there you go. Fantastic. Good. There you go. So thank you for sharing all that uh, wisdom, Dad. As always. It's always appreciative. And we love sharing these nuggets with all of you. And like you said, we talk about there's a common theme between all of our podcasts. And that's the thing I've realized is that sometimes when you're healing, you need to be you need to hear things over and over and over again for you to hear it. And even if you listen to this podcast a couple of times, you might hear different things each time because the nervous system may not be ready to hear what it needs yet but it's coming it's coming you're on if you're listening to this you're on a healing journey and we applaud your efforts and we think appreciate you being here and so for our next episode we're going to be talking about insulin resistance because that's another thing that's on the rise as well so we're going to talk <clears throat> dive into that a little bit more so again thank you for being here for supporting us and we look forward to chatting with you next time all right everybody we'll talk again <laughs>